Her name was Jessie. She was a jazz singer, possessed of a sexuality so strong as to be unsettling. In ancient Greece, she would have launched ships and started wars. In Buffalo, New York, she drove strangers wild with a lust they couldn't understand. Male and female, everyone wanted Jessie, and she chose me. She came into the coffee shop I worked at every day. She didn't just turn heads, she stopped commerce. <laughs> Eyes found excuses to drift her way. The old men who played dominoes stopped arguing. College kids wrist deep in highlighter ink and biology remembered they were 21 for a moment. <laughs> Young mothers en route to Zumba, strip aerobics, or whatever exercise trend their husbands were paying for leered with disgust <laughs> at her impossible frame. Five foot four and slender with double D breasts that poured forth. We looked forward to her lunch hour, spent our smoke breaks wondering what she'd wear. Converse and jeans, fur and lace, plum lipstick, gunpowder eyes, Jewish script tattooed between her breasts, her middle name, Hadara, Hebrew for beauty. We would see her sing at the local lounge. She played piano and guitar, but didn't need them. Her voice was like a soft tremor from a dark place. Throaty, smoky notes accented by feminine coups that brought out a rapture in me. I wanted to grab her and fuck her right there on the stage. Everyone did. <laughs> One of my friends at the coffee shop finally got the nerve to ask her out. She said yes. The rest of us waited around the bar that night like kids without a prom date, just dying to know how it went. He came back befuddled and, in his words, weirded out. <laughs> <laughs> she told him he was kind of boring, but still offered to fuck him if he had a camera to film it with so she could send it to a man she was seeing in New York. <laughs> All the guys wrote her off after that, <laughs> except me. <laughs> I was doubly intrigued. <laughs> we never spoke a word to each other, but I'd take her body with my eyes. We held long spells of eye contact. It became a game. I embraced the primal instinct she aroused. In my mind's eye, I'd bite her neck, hold her down, make her beg and scream and call me sir. <laughs> Our unspoken affair escalated. I swear I could smell her getting wet in line. My barista's apron did nothing to hide the effect <laughs> she had on me. One day, she wrote her number in red crayon on the back of a receipt. She stopped coming into the coffee shop. I waited a week to call. I wanted to make her wait. We met on a Wednesday. We drank wine, smoked opium, and talked all night. We had the same taste in everything. She introduced me to her finger puppets, Ferdinand and Rosie. <laughs> She'd had them since she was four and made them argue in Spanish, French, or Italian, depending on their mood. <laughs> she played Tom Waits and sang Nina Simone. She was amazing. We didn't talk about sex. We didn't have to. It was there, hanging in the air, like the seconds before a kiss, the growl before the bite. We didn't have sex either. But as I left, I pinned her to the wall, kissed her with the ferocity my fantasies held, and slowly sucked her tongue as I pulled away. The following Saturday, she answered the door in stockings and lace. We left handprints, scratches, bite marks. Snooping through her bathroom cabinet that morning, 
We've all been there. <laughs> I found a treasure trove of opiates and antipsychotics. I had been warned, but I didn't care. <laughs> Jesse was a masochist and a genius. To this day, one of the smartest people I've ever met. She had the power to control and manipulate. In the year before we met, she had got, then lost, two high-paying jobs and a record contract. She would build her life up to heights of accomplishment and then smash it like a porcelain doll to satisfy the masochistic beast inside her. People fell at her feet like marionettes untethered. I was one of them. Things escalated quickly. We spent some daylight hours together, but mostly just holed up in her apartment and fucked. We had sex that raised the dew point and made old women in neighboring counties cross themselves. Sex that deserved its own horn section. Sex with teeth and nails. Sex that made the moon howl back at dogs. Lust bit, bound down, don't stop fucking. <laughs> we made that video she wanted too. <laughs> To call her a submissive is to symbolize the union. Uh, it's like a wedding for kinks. The night I collared Jesse, I made grape leaves and pork braised lamb. We drank good Malbec and smoked strong Afghani hash. I presented her gift in an antique hat box wrapped in lace. A white leather collar with two rings opposite the clasp, a matching set of wrist cuffs and a leash to lead her with. She dressed for the occasion. Short black skirt, matching leather boots, and a bodice bound tight to present her breast to me. I led her on the leash to Delaware Park, my favorite spot, an old weeping willow tree on the edge of a pond behind the cemetery. The moon looking down like an eye half closed, as if it knew the horror show to come and couldn't bear to watch. I instructed her to face the tree with her hands on the trunk. She obeyed. I wound a rope round the tree and through the cuffs on her grip and through the root and through the rings on her cuffs, binding her to the ancient thing. We fucked slowly, sweetly. When we finished, I unbound her, and we laid with each other under the tree. I asked her if she wanted a safe word, a signal to stop if things ever went too far. She said no. I'm not a, a masochist needs a sadist, one who enjoys inflicting pain upon others. I'm not a sadist, I'm a kind person who happens to enjoy kinky sex. <laughs> Jessie had a beast to feed. Things were good, but the animal inside her couldn't bear to be happy. She became a fiend for opiates and barbiturates. Her drug use increased. She already had one attempted suicide behind her that she refused to talk about and had ready access to anything she wanted. Seroquel, Valium, Lithium, and Xanax. But prescriptions run out, and doctors ask questions. When the pills ran low, she turned to self-mutilation, cutting her thighs to bloody ribbons with whatever razor she could find. I pleaded, begged her to stop. It made me cry to see her legs like that. She couldn't. She needed more. She got in my head. Dysfunction and madness spiraled into mutual insanity. She had incredible sway over whoever loved her. Her life began to unravel, and mine went with it. She was too high to keep a job, 
So I started stealing food from the coffee shop and selling drugs to support us. We had vicious fights over drugs, money, and make-believe affairs we conjured in our fucked up heads. People wanted her. Strangers approached her daily. She'd hold this over me and then freak out any time a girl gave me a second look. She became increasingly depressed and withdrew from the world. I paid her rent, made sure she ate, and drove her to an endless string of doctor's appointments. My friends tried to talk sense to me. Everyone told me to cut it off, but I couldn't. She'd die without me, right? They kidnapped me for a camping trip one weekend and wouldn't let me touch my phone. I came home to a mutilated mess. Her cutting was out of control. The cutting made me ill. I, I couldn't look at it, which only made things worse. The wounds revolted me beyond the point of arousal, so she satisfied herself on the phone with that man from New York, an old daddy dom who made her feel like a dog. I found out and fucking lost it. More screaming, fighting, tears. Her prescriptions ran out, so she started buying Oxycontin on the street. Driving her back from an appointment where she was denied a refill of Seroquel, she flipped, freaking out, screaming, pounding on the window, rifling through the glove box till she found what she needed, a pair of old scissors. She slashed at her legs with abandon. I swerved into oncoming traffic trying to grab them from her. Fuck you, Eddie! Fuck you! You don't know what it's like! One cut went too far. There was blood on the window, the dashboard, and both of our clothes. She knew a walk-in clinic that didn't ask questions if you paid in cash. While they stitched her up, I waited outside pacing, smoking, shaking. I took her home and put her to bed, bandaged like a broken bird. The next morning, we struck a tenuous truce. She threw away her Oxycontin, agreed to go to counseling, and called things off with the man in New York. I had hope. One week later, I came home to the smoke alarm going off. I found a frozen pizza cooked down to the size of a hockey puck in the oven. I called her name, no answer. She wasn't in the bedroom, but the bathroom door was locked. Jesse, Jesse, are you in there? Nothing, nothing. Jesse, are you in there, baby? Nothing, nothing. I'm not a break the door down kind of guy, but I had no other choice. After three attempts, the door swung open, and I saw her there, passed out on the toilet with a needle in her arm, like a flag at half-mast. Jesse chose heroin, the ultimate dom. I slid the needle out of her arm, cleaned the puncture, and bandaged it with tape and gauze. I laid her in bed and sat with her all night, checking every few minutes to make sure she was still breathing. She woke up once and smiled at me. You, she said sweetly. I knew it would be you. She kissed the tip of my finger and fell back asleep. I left. I went back to that willow tree and wept. I woke the next morning with my back to the graveyard, eyes ripped open by the dawn. A week later, I fled to Thailand with $600 to my name and no return ticket, half insane with loss, licking my wounds. I buried myself in Bangkok, ripped open, raw, wishing she had asked me if I 
wanted a safe word. A signal to stop if things ever went too far. Matt Duell.